but you should be able to take a, a pitching wedge out and hit it 50, 60, 70, mm. 80. Now, you should be able to hit it all those distances. That's called shot making. Uh, the great players like Hogan, he would hit every club in the bag in, in, during a practice round 25 times, and he'd hit them different trajectories, left to right, right to left, high and low. Uh, and he could stand out there and with his whole set of clubs and hit a green about 150, 160 with every club in the bag, including the driver. So he had the ability to speed it up or slow it down and still make a, a legitimate swing and, and hit the ball flush. That's what's missing today. If a person would take the clubs that they have and practice with them and use them for different distances, you'd be surprised. They could literally eliminate some of the clubs in their bag and still, have, and still be able to play without any problem. You're making a basic assumption that we practice. That's what you're going to hear in today's episode with Tony Manzoni. And as most of the USA and actually so much of the world is now on lockdown due to the pandemic that's only getting worse, I continue to ask myself, is golf instruction really the kind of information we need right now? And then I get into an email exchange with Daryl Rupp, a Golf Smarter listener who's serving in the U.S. military over in Belgium. As for putting this show on hiatus, he says... Uh, I would say that the more we have that can be normal during these times, the better. If you're able to keep the podcast going, I know I would appreciate the taste of normality while listening. Okay, you got me. Here we are. Now, as for today's show, we continue where we started last week on Golf Smarter Mulligans with part two of episode 594, talking about getting the most out of your game one club at a time. We go to part one of episode 595 this week, which discusses other clubs we haven't gotten to. And the completion of this conversation, which is part three of taking your game to the next level one club at a time, has just been released as Golf Smarter Mulligans number 49. This is Golf Smarter number 733. Part two of three with Tony Manzoni on taking your game to the next level, one club at a time. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter podcast, Tony. Great to be back. It's good to have you again. Thank you for, uh, even though it's been a week since we've recorded our last one, usually when we do two-part episodes, we'll record one right after the other, but you had to go, so it's great that we can just go ahead and pick this up. Before we started recording a moment ago, we were talking about our excitement that the NBA Finals is beginning tonight. Now, I know when people listen to this, it's going to be old news, so I don't want to talk about the teams and their chances and what's going to happen, but, you know... There's something about the Warriors that is so interesting um, that there are two players, Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, who are all stars and and Steph's a superstar, but they both grew up in an NBA arena, right? Both of their fathers played in the NBA, right? And then you think about players like Ken Griffey Jr., who grew up in a major league dugout because his dad played in the majors. And uh, there's, you know, other baseball players as well. What kind of impact, or do you know of players on the PGA Tour whose fathers were also players on the PGA Tour, and what kind of impact did it have on them in their play? Well, in some cases, um, if the dads were great, let's say like Nicholas, it's it's very difficult for the sons to... Um, to, they, they they go in there with an anchor uh, because they've got to beat a record that's already been established. So that's the downside. The upside to it a lot of times is that because the, their dads were involved in the, in a sport, whether it's baseball or whatever, uh, they have a better comfort zone there, and, and they have a better understanding of what's going to happen because they've been around it, you know, all their youth. So um, you know, it's kind of a a two prong thing there. One is one is a little bit tough on you the other one makes it a little bit easier yeah i could see how that but if that's if in fact you do pursue 
the same line that your dad did. You know, it's like a lot of a lot of kids I can see just going, yeah, I want nothing to do with that because there's, you know, I can't match up to them and I don't care. Well, that's true. I mean, I, you know, I, I was lucky enough to know uh, Frank Sinatra a bit and his son was a tremendous singer. But, you know, how are you going to stand up to Frank? Yeah, it uh, always it, seemed it, like it, Frank Jr. was a junior. He always just seemed like a bad copy of Frank trying to do Frank. He never seemed like, you know, at least I never knew him and just what I saw of him on television, that he was just trying to do Frank and it just wasn't working. Well, it, it, you know, the, the the truth be known, his his speaking voice uh, was exactly like Frank. So wow. his singing voice was going to be similar. Uh, he didn't have the pizzazz and the aura that Frank presented. Sure. And he didn't really have the chops that Frank had either. But he sounded like his dad. I remember when I used to, I was involved in the, um, celebra- the celebrity event that Barbara Sinatra put on for abused children. And one year, uh, Frank Jr. did the show. This was after his dad had passed. And it was eerie. I mean, you you would think it was Frank Sinatra on stage until you saw him. Uh, and, and then the way he handled him. So he had very unique uh, ways about him when he sang. He did some really cool things. But his dad had, you know, when, his, when Frank got on the stage, I don't care who was up there previous, he just owned the thing. Mm-hmm. He just had that. He just had that it thing. You know, that's it. Plus, he could sing his butt off. <laughs> um, and then talking about Wayward Sons, I, I have to do it. Uh, any comments about Tiger? You know, I don't know the details. If you know, I do understand that you should be, you know, you can't mix prescription drugs. Right. Uh, but a bigger question is, you're worth seven hundred and fifty million dollars. What are you driving from Northern Cal to, uh, uh, to, to Southern Cal by yourself? Number one, and why don't ha- why not have a driver? Why well, wasn't he in uh, Florida? I I th- or in, he was going. I mean, it was a long drive. He was going to Florida or some someplace. Yeah, he, he said he was going was, home and he was going in the opposite direction. Yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, you know, when you look at the look at the videos that they're showing, it's very incriminating, but. You know, I know of people that have had really bad reactions to drugs uh, that that are mixed. Uh, so I think the I think the jury is still out. Uh, but a lot of people like to make a big deal out of it and make him look like a bad guy. You know, he's yeah. got a lot of people that don't like him. Sure. Uh, and and that kind of comes with the territory of being famous. But I think there's also a lot of people who are going, oh, that's so sad. Oh. Sure. I think there's a lot of people feel bad. You yeah. Know? I mean, uh, uh, it's. You know, with Tiger, uh, at one time he could have run for president. Yeah. And then after. Well, well he after, he came onto the scene. He he kind of exploded onto the global stage at the same time as Barack Obama. Right. I mean, yeah. a little yeah, bit earlier, a, but at 2008, he was at his pinnacle. And here comes Barack Obama. And anywhere in the world, it was kind of a debate on. Who was the most recognizable person in the world at that moment? Was it Tiger or was it Barack Obama? Yeah, I think I would have voted for Tiger, to be honest with you. He mm. was, you know, he was bigger than life there for a while. And unfortunately, uh, because of his escapades, yeah. uh, he, he, he lost favor with everyone yeah. for, a, for a bit of time. And then little by little, people start creeping back into his camp, including sponsors. But there for a while, he was very disliked because he had this, perfect marriage kids the whole thing and then he dumps it for you know for doing stupid things yeah yeah um my greatest fear in all of this um that you know with all the surgeries that he's had and he's had multiple back surgeries and if you've been following the warriors you know about steve kerr and he's now regrets the, the surgeries that he had he says you should never do back surgery and what tigers now had four uh, my greatest fear is that he's addicted to pain meds. That's that's a a very good possibility. Yeah, very good possibility. Sure. Uh, it, like you said, he's had so many uh, operations. Uh, you know, and I I go back to I met Tiger a long time ago uh, at a at a tournament a celebrity tournament. He just happened to be there because there's a lot of celebrities there. Was he a and pro at this point? Was he still a pro? Was he already a pro at this point, or was he still before that? 
Uh, no, it was before that. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, the first thing I noticed that he was very small boned for a guy that hit it so far. Uh, he, he was out of college and, and he, you know, he could bench press 300 pounds when he weighed 150. So he was a real strong guy and he was very, he could run really fast too. Uh, but I noticed that he, he had, his hands are medium sized, but his wrists were very small. And so his tendons and everything were, and were built for, for that kind of a frame. And then he started doing all the weight training and heavyweight training and got very big uh, and it's still big really. And I think that, that you know you can put on a lot of muscle but your structure is built for a certain body type and i and i think that's where a lot of his injuries came from is just that he got so heavy muscled and i don't think his tendons could hold up his knees and so forth the back everything kind of fell apart because i did a tournament years ago called kids for kids and i had justin leonard and tiger a tiger just hit the drive uh on one of the holes it was like a pro-am to raise money for children that couldn't afford to play golf and so forth and i remember uh i was a i was fairly long hitter at that time and i got up on the hole where there's a long drive contest and i really cracked when i was thinking man nobody's catching that one and i got out there and i saw this little flag about 40 yards ahead of my ball i says well what the heck is that he says oh that's where that 16 year old kid hit it and i mean tiger must wait he looked like he weighed about 50 pounds when i when he was there just skinnier than heck but boy he could just move the ball and i think he hit it farther as an amateur than he did as a pro really and he was he was skinny he was not i you know big muscled people uh don't hit it long uh, davis love is a perfect example of a long lean guy that hit it long even even in his later years hmm. so I, I think he's mistaken i think and i'm i'm afraid that rory mcelroy's done the same thing he got into really heavy weight training you know way way back when there was a guy by the name of frank stranahan uh who was a he was the first bodybuilder golfer and and i just don't think that the two match i don't think they go together hmm. interesting And then, uh, like Jose Canseco was like the first big weightlifter for baseball, and then the accusation of steroids, and then everybody else, and then he came out and said, sure. you know, he. And what's so interesting is he came out and said he was going to do this book that everybody's doing steroids, and everyone's like chastised him and berated him and pretty much blackballed him from the world of baseball. And now, that many years later, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> All sure, along, he sure. was the one that was so, right. You can't blame athletes for trying to get an edge when everybody else is doing the same thing. Absolutely, and you know, the no one's really said, no one's ever been definitive about steroids and things like that. What they can and cannot do, and if you don't abuse them, I mean, doctors prescribe them for God's sake. So, uh, but uh, the problem is, is that when you get into weight training and you get into okay, my arms are this big, I want to get them bigger, and I want to do this. You're in that arena where that stuff is bandied about, and that's when you get. That's when you you're you know it's. I think it's it, I think it's like a something that is like a drug almost. You you want to get bigger, you want to get stronger. Uh, you get in the gym, you're pre- bench pressing so much, you want to press more, and that stuff is available, and it, it kind of calls out to you, and, and that's when that's when the mistakes start happening. You start injecting stuff and and doing more of it than you should, and and then you pay the piper. Yeah. That's why you see so many football players dying so early. Uh, I really attribute it to a lot of that uh, kind of stuff. Uh, the steroids and the pain medication. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, the, when you OD on that stuff or when you do it too much in your system, it eventually catches up with you. Sure, sure. All right, way off topic. Sorry about that. Um, let's get That's back okay. to what our, our conversation uh, started to be last week. I wanted to continue this week because you gave so much really valuable information. And what we're talking about is taking your your game to the next level one club at a time, and we're dissecting each of the clubs in our bag to see what we can do to improve our game um, and improve our ball striking and um, lower our scores by focusing on practicing with each club and what we can do. Last week we talked about the putter, the eight iron, chipping with an eight iron, and the lob wedge, uh, and the sand wedge, and then, you know, how, how a ball releases um, when, you're, when you're chipping and how much it releases. So if you missed that, you've got to go back to hear that. But 
let's talk now. Let's start again here. Um, let's start at the sandwich. We really didn't cover much of it. Uh, what? Tell me what what I need to know, do better with my sandwich that I'm not doing that's going to get the ball closer to the hole. Well, you know, the, the, the sandwich is a marvelous club. Gene Sarazen was the one that invented the thing, and um, it's been primarily used for bunker shots and shots in and around the green and hitting flop shots. But then with the advent of higher lofted clubs being made with blob wedge and so forth, uh, in, in my estimation, and this is just my opinion, and maybe I'm just a little old school because I am old, um, <laughs> I like to hit all kinds of shots with the sand wedge. I don't even carry a, you know, I put a six degree in and it, it befuddled me because I couldn't get the distance control that I wanted. I, I, I expected more distance and I came up short with a lot of shots. Um, so I've learned, I've gone back to the sand wedge. I've taken a little bounce off of it so I can use it in the fairways and I can open it up and hit that lob shot. And it really, it's, that that's what you should do. When, when I got to know, when I was with Callaway and I got to know uh, Chichi Rodriguez a little bit and listen to him, you know, he had about 20 shots with the wedge. Uh, he could just do anything with it. And then in subsequent talks with Lee Trevino, uh, Lee Trevino, he said, I could, I could do brain surgery with my wedge. Uh, you know, that's, that is a, if you want to play golf and shoot low numbers, You've got to be a wizard with those short clubs, especially the sand wedge and pitching wedge and, and the shots around the green. But the sand wedge is a fantastic club, but you must make sure that you have the correct bounce for what you're trying to get done. Uh, and, and that's uh, – and, and, you know, I, I love the Cleveland wedges. I love the, the title is Vokey wedges. They seem to be who, – whoever is doing the design – and seems to be a good player and understands what they should be like, especially in the bounce area. Can you, it's been discussed before, but there's still, it's confusing. What do you mean by bounce? Well, bounce, it, it, there's a, you know, the flange on the golf club. Well, if you take a club and turn it over, you'll see that a high bounce club, the, the flange kind of sticks out a little bit. It's, it, it, it's higher. I'm sorry, it's flange higher. is is the part that touches the ground? Yes. Okay. That's, so a high, uh, 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 the idea of the flange is that um, you, you, it, it penetrates the, the, the sand a little bit. It goes into the sand a little bit, and that's what puts sand on the face of the club, and then you hit the ball, and the ball comes out soft. Um, so way back when, I've, I've got a, an old wizard wedge by Johnny Revolta that's like an anvil, very heavy, big, big flange on it. Uh, but it was primarily for the sand. For the sand, um, but you, you also want a, a sand wedge that you can use off the turf. And if you have too much bounce on it, uh, and you're hitting off a tight lie, uh, you're going to hit some some nifty little skull shots that you 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 don't want. Uh, so uh, I, I've always believed that I want to. I, I can get the ball out of the bunker, uh, and I don't need I don't need that that. The, the high loft of the, of the bounce. I don't need a high, a, a big, a big bounce on it. I can use a, a lower bounce and I just open the thing up and I feel like I want to slide the club under the ball a little bit more. Uh, I don't, I don't stick it in the sand so much and explode it out. Uh, and I think in today's world, you see more of the sliders where they slide the ball out a little bit. Uh, you don't see the too much chunk and run uh, as, as you did way back when. Uh, so, I like a, a when I like my sandwich to be a, a little bit more utility for me, where I can use it in the fairways, use it off of a tight lie, and use it in the bunker. So the, the that that little piece that comes down, it's kind of a V shape. That's that's what it looks like when you're looking at the bounce. And the the, the more V the shape is, the bigger the bounce. Are you saying it's hard, that- hard to say? <laughs> Yeah, no, no. It's hard to explain without holding a club up. Yeah, it's hard to explain with words. You have to see it. Yeah. Are are you saying that it's easier to get the ball to um, stop when you slide it under the, when you're in a bunker or when you explode it out? To get the ball to stop, it has to do with speed. Uh, The more speed you can generate and hit and do it properly, the more spin you put on the ball, the more you stop the ball. Backspin. Uh, 
a lot of a lot of people like to uh, hit it so that it releases a little bit. Not, not too many guys are trying to carry it to the hole and make it stop. That's the, the, the conditions have to be perfect for that in the sand. Uh, but you watch the guys today; they really they, they have that blade really open uh, with the sand shot, and you know they just come from out to in on it and uh, slide that baby underneath. Ventura used to. I when, I when I when he was alive and I got to play a little golf with him, I used to watch him, and that that was his thing. He's I'd feel as if there's a a tee under the ball and try to clip that tee. Um, and I, I hit a lot of skull shots for a while until I got that feeling where I could slide the thing underneath. You said perfect conditions when the when the um, when your ball's in the sand and under perfect conditions. For I, I, for me, I'm a public course guy. Right, I don't play the country club that has fresh sand brought in every six months. And so, lots of times, especially after a harsh winter like we had, uh, you know, the sand, the bunkers are now hardly sand; they're almost mud, or have turned into hard, you know, hard dirt. Um, yeah. What, what are perfect to, conditions? Well, then you have to get a little. You know, when you have it really hard pan, you got to be steeper on the shot. You got to literally make your own sand by hitting straight down into it and digging a little bit that you, you, you just, that's what, that would be a condition where you're, you're stuck with that. Cause if you try to pinch it off of a hard pan, you run the risk of the club bouncing because of the law of the bounce on the club and, and it bounces into the ball when I mean, you know, the club head bounces into the ball and you hit it in the middle of the ball and skull it. So in that case, you got to get steeper with it. Um, the, the problem in Muni places and places like that, it not only is, sometimes there's way too much sand and it's really soft because it's not, it's not a silica sand. It's a, it's like a blow sand that you get in, or in the desert. And that's really much more difficult uh, to get it out and, and make it do what you want it to do. In that case, you're just trying to get it out and hope for, hoping for the best. Uh, but you, if you look at the tour, the, the, the bunkers are per- perfect in the, and they, and they have kind of what they call a silica sand. And it, it's, it's, it's a tight sand in a way. You can slide the club under, but it's not arduous where you can't get it through. That well, real heavy, heavy sand yeah. is very difficult. And when you look at the tour, you'll notice that um, even if they hit wayward shots, they don't lose balls. That's because there's people standing there watching where they land. I mean, it would be so much nicer and we'd play so much better if we didn't have to go searching for a ball that we, we saw land and, oh, okay, it's in the rough over there and you can't find it. Anyway, that's my own Yeah, very, issue. very seldom do you see a, a lost ball on tour because there's so many people watching. Right. Uh, it happens occasionally, but very seldom. And plus, I think the average guy's errant shot is a little bit more errant than the pros. Um, but you're right. It, 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 it's a, that's a great thing. that You never, never really lose a ball. Yeah. Is there a difference of the way bunkers are prepared or the type of sand that are in bunkers in the fairway versus the greenside bunkers? No, they're generally, you know, if they're using a silica sand, they're using it on all the bunkers. Uh, um, typically, muni courses, uh, they're, they're using a heavier sand, uh, so it stays in there a little bit more. Um, but the, but they they don't use a different sand for fairways. Then they do a green side generally. Okay, good. Need to know that. How many how many wedges do you carry in your bag? Uh, a pitching wedge and a sand wedge. So what, how, do you carry 14 clubs? Sure. Then... I just load up. Yeah, where do you I load up? Driver I load up with the rescue clubs. How many do you carry? Yeah, let me see. I've got a... A driver, three wood, five wood, uh, uh, three, four, five, three, four, five, uh, rescue, then six, seven, eight, nine, pitching wedge, sand wedge, and putter. And what are your, what are your, that's interesting because, um, so I carry driver, four wood, then a high, three hybrid, four hybrid, and my irons are five, six, seven, eight, nine, um, pitch. Gap, sand, lob. 
Mm-hmm. I care. I'm more on on the wedge side because to me it's you know uh, I I'll, I'll hit my four wood. You know my driver I can hit. Uh, I average like two forty or two in between two forty and two fifty. Um, but the um, I can hit my um, four wood about two ten to two twenty, and then my three hybrid I hit. 200 and then 185 so to me that i feel like i've got all that covered that distance because i'm not going to go beyond yeah, that distance. Like, you know each individual is different uh sure. you know, i tried the gap wedge for a while but again it, it was confusing for me um first of all unless you're unless you really play a lot and you're very skilled the the hardest part is distance control if I've got a 91-yard shot, it's really hard for me to hit it 91 yards. Uh, I, I remember the funny story. The caddy said, uh, Hogan said to the caddy, how far is it? He says, it's uh, 96 or 97. He says, which one is it? Uh, <clears throat> because that's how uh, immaculate Hogan was about playing the game. I mean, he really could hit it within yards. Uh, but the average person, even a guy's on tour, uh, as you can see, they're either short or long most of the time. So what's the difference so, in your distance between your pitching wedge and your sand wedge uh, on a full swing? You know, I had my set my set set up so that my sand wedge is a little on the strong side, so it's a little closer to my pitching wedge, so there's no need for the gap. My my sand wedge is a 54 degree. A lot of them are 56s mm. and so forth. Right. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't find it. I, I've never had a problem. And I played for years before there was gap wedges and 60 degree wedges. And I was, did just fine. But, you know, manufacturers put that seed in your head so you can buy more product. I mean, you know, yeah. you got to have a you gotta have a gap wedge. You got to have a 60 degree. I mean, and I think Mickelson has a 64 degree or something like that. I'd be afraid I was going to hit myself in the head with a thing, you know, so. Um, but I, I don't. I just don't see a need for it. Well, I have like a thirty-five yard difference between my pitching wedge and my sand wedge, and to me, that's like, uh, why would I want a thirty-five yard gap there when it could be so many different shots for me? As I'm getting, you know, for my approach shot, I can deal with a twenty-five yard distance between my long ones. But on the short yeah, shots, but, but but you can you, you, you maybe your pitching wedge is a little strong and your your sand wedge is a little weak, but you should be able to take a a pitching wedge out and hit it fifty, sixty, seventy, hmm. eighty. Now you should be able to hit it all those distances. So, <clears throat> I mean, for heaven's sakes, they didn't have uh, lob wedges or or rescue. I mean, uh, uh, you, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, gap wedges for a long, uh, our gap clubs for a long time, uh, and people were able to, you know, th- that's called shot making, you, and 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 th- and that gets back to th- these clubs. You know, uh, the great players like Hogan, he he would hit every club in the bag in, in during a practice round twenty five times, and he hit them different trajectories, left to right, right to left, high and low, uh, and he could stand out there. And with his whole set of clubs and hit and hit a green, say out about 150, 160, with every club in the bag, including the driver. So he had the ability to speed it up or slow it down and still make a, a legitimate swing and and hit the ball flush. That's what's missing today. Uh, everything is, uh, you know, I hit a seven iron 170, and that's all I hit it. Well, you should be able to hit it 120 or 110. Uh, if if a if a person would take the clubs that they have and practice with them and and use them for different distances, you'd be surprised they could literally eliminate some of the clubs in their bag and still have, and still be able to play without any problem. You're making a basic assumption that we practice. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I can't tell that's, you how many people complain about the fact that they want to be more consistent, but they never practice. Right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, oh man, well, if I was only more consistent, well, what, what are you doing to work on that? No, well, I go yeah, out and play golf. The world, when the best in the world, that that's all they do for a living is play golf. Ah, the when key they, words they, there. The key words for a living. <laughs> we all yeah, have to do that, other things. Well, that, yeah, that's why. I mean, you can't expect to. 
to 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 play at the level that they play and and not hit the ball a number of balls that they hit. I mean, just not possible. You, it, this it's just a comfort thing. It's a mental thing, really. Uh, when you've hit a lot of balls, you're storing that in your subconscious mind. Uh, and the, and the better you hit it, the better picture you have in your subconscious mind. Average guy when he goes to play, he does. I mean, he doesn't know what's going to happen that day. Uh, in, in, probably within a 20-stroke uh, period, where the touring pro, you know, he if he has a bad day, he's going to shoot 72 or three or four. The average guy who maybe averages, let's just say, 85, he doesn't know if it's going to be 120, 95. Or maybe a, a, a eighty, and and that's because because you know, the the golf clubs aren't his friends uh, because he hasn't hang hung out with them enough. You know? <laughs> that's, that's, a- that's one of the things I I talk about when I when someone asks you know if I play for money it's like no I'm competing against too many things that I can't bring money into the equation as well because then I really freak out and one of the things that I feel like I'm competing <laughs> against is my golf clubs. I mean, there's the terrain, sure. there's the weather, there's my head, and then a, a different club for every shot, different length, and, you know, so I'm competing against those two. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, the game is, you know, we manifest a lot of things, like like the, the thing when I have a young lady that I teach, I'm not going to use her name, but she she constantly talks to me about the pressure, and, you know, that's a that's something that we, that we, we create uh, because of doubt. There's no such thing as pressure. I mean, the golf ball doesn't know anything about pressure. The golf clubs don't know anything about pressure. Uh, the player is the one that is, is putting a value on the, on the shot uh, that doesn't need to be put on it. You know, I got a 150 yard shot to a, a, a green. I've got a club I select, and and if I make a decent swing, I should be able to put it on that green. But now. If I don't put it on that green, I may lose the tournament. Or if I, I if I hit in that bunker or hit in the water, well, those, these are all perceptions, uh, and and that's what as a coach, that's what I'm always trying to explain to my players that there is no such thing as pressure. When the flag goes up, it's no different. The golf course didn't change, the ball didn't change. The only thing that changes is your mindset. See, so uh, in 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 trying to be a good golfer, you have to work on that aspect too, and of course. The more that you practice and the more good shots that you see, the better chance you have of having a good image as you stand up to that ball getting ready to strike it to a target. And before the replay of this interview, I told you about my email thread with uh, golf martyr Daryl Rupp, who's in Belgium serving in the U.S. military. Thank you for doing that. Daryl's pretty much a self-taught golfer, playing for 16 years with a 7.1 handicap. And in regards to the March with Manzoni, he writes um, that uh, the feedback he was... No, no, no. The, the recently, I've been playing pretty well. Uh, several rounds in the 74 to 76 range. Yeah, it's pretty well. But I have to say a lot of what uh, wa- a lot of that was the antithesis of what Tony was talking about. But I've had some really horrible rounds as well where I can't seem to get what I thought were my swing keys to work. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Uh, the feedback I was getting from the opti shot, swing path, face angle, etc., indicated that my good contact was more luck and timing rather than good fundamentals in my swing. So I started applying some of what I was hearing uh, from Tony, like adjusting the path of my takeaway, weight to the left side, playing on the left, etc. It immediately got my swing path almost on plane, just a touch inside to outside, which I think is okay. Uh, My face contact was in the center of the club, and the club face was closer to square much more consistently. I feel the swing is much more repeatable and consistent and all of the feedback I'm getting from the simulator where the balls are going into the net and my hands, everything, makes me feel that I'm in for another level of improvement. Boy, can't get much better than that. Thank you, Tony Manzoni, and thank you, Daryl, for everything. So um, the completion of this conversation which is going to be part three of taking your game to the next level, one club at a time has just been released as golf smarter Mulligan's number 49 
Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by two guys with golfballs.com, and this is it. The golf ball deal that you will regret if you don't take advantage of it. Premium used golf balls that are closer to brand new than anything you'll ever find on the golf course. So before the time runs out, on April, tw- April 1st, 2020, spend more than $49 at two guys with golfballs.com, use Golf Smarter at checkout, and receive 20% discount on your entire purchase. Think about what it's going to do for your season. We're all looking to save money, not spend it. Of course. We don't want to spend extra money, but you're going to be buying golf balls anyway. So go ahead and get the balls that you want in premium condition and not only pay half, pay even less because you're getting 20% discount with that coupon code GOLFSMARTER at twoguyswithgolfballs.com. Email your friends. Scream about it from the 18th grade if you get to go out there. Post it on your social media, but the clock is ticking louder and louder. Just spend a minimum $49 at two guys with golfballs.com. Use Golf Smarter at checkout and save 20% on your entire purchase. There's been a lot of online conversation about the status of golf courses during this global lockdown promoting social isolation. Clearly, golf has been a positive element in my life for both my mental and physical well being. But should we feel guilty about going out on the golf course when we're being told to stay indoors and away from everyone? Guilt plays a big part in our golf for many of us. Now, for the hacker who plays with a clean conscience, let him know that the majority of us spend our rounds beating ourselves up because we should be doing something else, like checking off items on the to-do list, being with the family, advancing our careers, practicing social isolation. (laughs) So just follow your local public health guidelines, take proper precautions, and practice your short game. You can do that at home. I said this last week, and I'll repeat my pleas to not dismiss the urgency, but do what you can to keep your sanity. As someone said to me the other day, I've not lost my mind yet, but it's definitely trying to escape. Now, even though our next publication date is officially still March, we're going to finish our month with Manzoni on Golf Smarter Mulligans next week. But here on Golf Smarter, we're going to bring back Thomas Malcho on what you can do at home to keep your body golf ready. That's going to be really good to hear. Tony's book, The Lost Fundamental, is available in both paperback and Kindle format. I'll leave a link to today's show notes on the blog post at golfsmarter.com, how to get that book. And if you want the video too, please click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com or write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com and I'll send you information on how to get private access to the online video. For the most comprehensive information on Tony that you'll find anywhere on the web, please go to golfsmarter.com slash Tony. Please follow at Golf Smarter on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Read more about our weekly content on LinkedIn. Or if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for me, just click on the Hey Fred button at GolfSmarter.com. Stay safe. Stay tuned. Play golf.